sure if anybody's old enough to remember, they will recall exactly where they were when they heard the devastating news that four commercial aircraft were hijacked, two were flown into the World Trade Center, one into the Pentagon, and a fourth was brought down by the heroes on United Flight 93 that crashed in Shanksville, PA with the motto of, let's roll. The world, the US was under attack. The date was September 11th, 2001, and will forever be known as 9-11. I was heading into New York City. As everybody was preparing to run away, people were escaping on trains, in cars, in buses, on ferries. They were all trying to leave the city. I was trying to get in. I always wanted to save lives. When I was seven years old, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. I wasn't talking about making a living and supporting a family. I was talking about being a volunteer, a paramedic, and a first responder. As I was riding an ambulance through a Brooklyn Battery Tunnel into the lower part of Manhattan, there was darkness everywhere. It was still morning, but it looked like dusk. Sirens were blaring. People were running to get away, trying to escape. There was dust particles. People were coughing and choking. People could hardly see. But that day, I met many heroes. Thousands of first responders were trying to get into the city. As our ambulance was trying to get through, there were cars tailgating, pickup trucks, with police officers, with firefighters, and with paramedics. Everybody was just trying to get in and just trying to save lives. We treated dozens of patients, dozens of police officers. People didn't recognize, people didn't have the masks that we use to be able to protect themselves. They were covering their mouths and noses with scarves, with shirts, with jackets, anything they can do. We were assured at that point that the dust particles were safe. It was that day that I got to meet many people who would shine their light into other people's darkness. The first person I met was a gentleman who I got to know very well, and his name was Steve Zakheim. I was with a crew of about 100 volunteer first responders, and Steve was the one who was really running this show. Steve, at that point, owned the largest ambulance company in New York State. And he brought, at his own expense, dozens of ambulances to respond. 2,977 innocent people died that day. 441 first responders. Steve lost 14 of his employees that day, EMTs and paramedics. Many lives were changed. My life was changed that day, too. And I realized that life is short. No one anticipated that September 11, 2001 would be their last day. And I realized that we never know where we stand on that bridge called life and when our time would be up. When do we cash our chips in? And I realized that we can't take anything along. No jets, no helicopters, no cars, no homes, no motorcycles, nothing. Not even a pair of socks. And I realized that I wanted to find happiness and purpose by giving and helping others. That would be my light. In the darkness, I found my light, and I wanted to shine the light into someone else's darkness. Each of us has something to give, something to share, whether it's your finances or the athletes or entertainers or anybody who goes and visits sick people and sick children in the hospitals, we all have a light and we have that ability to give to others. And when we shine our light into others, they in turn 
will be able to share with everybody else. My journey began. I wanted to find my purpose, I wanted to find my win, and I wanted to find my why. What could I do to help others? What can I do to give back? Within a few months, I left my work in the bail bonds industry, and I wanted to find something that would afford me the time to do more volunteering. Shortly after 9-11, I reconnected with Steve and I got to know him. He was a legend. He was a philanthropist, and his, and his goal in life was to give to others. I had learned that Steve owned his own private aircraft. He owned a private jet, a Lear 31 tail November 613 Sierra Zulu. And he used that jet not for business, but he used it to help others. He outfitted it with a stretcher and with oxygen, and he would fly patients all over the country. Anyone who needed to get to a specialty center, anybody who had to get to a rehab center, those who didn't have money, Steve would just send his jet to go help them. He would have his paramedics, volunteers, friends who would go along and treat these patients. And the first person, when he called me, he said, hey, would you like to join my team? And I said, absolutely. I'm on board. And the first person we, we took was a nine-year-old girl who had terminal cancer. She was being treated by a hospital in New York City. And her family was told, take her home. Make her comfortable. There's nothing else that we can do for her. However, there was a transplant and cancer center in Minnesota that was doing a study and was willing to take a chance to do what they could to help her to save her life. She just didn't have the ability to get there. That was the first trip that I went on. I can tell you that today she's 27 years old, she's married, she has two children, and she's cancer free. Steve was both sympathetic and empathetic to children of those who are sick with illness. Steve introduced me to an amazing camp, the best camp in the world, a camp called Camp Simcha. Camp Simcha is a medical camp for children with cancer and medical disabilities. For many years before I even met Steve, Steve would put children on helicopters He'd fly five to 600 children every summer. Kids would come off crying, saying, I touched heaven, or for 15 minutes, I forgot that I had cancer. Another team that Steve introduced me and brought me in was in 2010 or so, when he created something called the Dream Team. Dream Team stands for Delivering Real Exciting Adventures and Miracles where he would find children and adults who were terminally ill, and he would give them the last chance to do something special, something they always wanted to do. Our first trip was with a girl named Nechama. Nechama was 18 years old, and her parents and her were told she had between two days and two weeks to live. Steve approached her and said, I'll do anything you want. You pick the place, you pick the destination, and we're going to do it. Nechama said, I want to swim with the dolphins. That's my dream. So Steve actually had to charter a larger aircraft, a Gulfstream G4, because his aircraft only fit seven. We were taking 14 people along. Full medical team, myself, Steve, our friend Michael, who was another paramedic, and her friends and her counselors. And we flew to the Atlantis in the Bahamas. It was unbelievable. She smiled. She got her hair braided. She swam with the dolphins. She just had a great time. Two days, two days we were there. We flew her home, and two hours later, Nechama passed away. The next morning, we went to her funeral. And a few days after that, we received a phone call from the Atlantis, a dolphin cove, and they said that a new baby dolphin was born. And the impression that Nechama gave to all those who were there was incredible and outstanding, and she said, they said, we're naming a baby dolphin, Nechama. Now, we didn't really believe that it was true, because when we went back a short while later with Sari and Sydney, as we were approaching Dolphin Cove, Steve reaches out to the, to the guide who was taking us, and he says, 
I heard that there's some dolphin who was named after a girl who passed away. And the guide says, oh, you mean Akama? She said, come. We're going to go swim in Akama, the dolphin. She wasn't fully trained because she was still a baby, but we got to meet her. And Akama, the dolphin exists all because of somebody's incredible impression that they had. Steve, as I mentioned, introduced me to a camp called Camp Simcha, this medical camp. And I met many amazing, amazing people. And one of my closest friends ended up becoming a young man named Yochi. Yochi, at the point that I met him, was 15 years old. And he was in camp because when he was eight years old, he was a kidney and liver transplant because he developed interstitial kidney and liver disease. Steve was, um, uh, Yochi was amazing. He had such a spirit, he was so classy. Yochi only wore custom clothes. He only went to fancy cars. He had the latest technology. He loved life. All he wanted to do was live. In 2012, October 2012, I got a devastating email. It was from Steve. Steve says, I got some great news. You see, I'm tested every month because I take Lipitor for high cholesterol. And during a return blood work, my counts were off and I was just diagnosed with leukemia. That was a leukemia that he received because of his exposure at 9-11. As I mentioned earlier, Steve had lost 14 of his employees and Steve spent greater than 30 days at ground zero. Steve said, I'm gonna be in Sloan Kettering Hospital for the next little while. I'm gonna be off the grid. I'm gonna need you guys to take the lead for a bit, but I'm gonna coordinate. And Steve continued to coordinate and run charity trips and dream team trips from his hospital bed. A month before Steve passed, he called me into his room and he said, I want you to take my jet. And I said, okay, where are we going? He goes, no, I want you to take my jet. I said, Steve, I don't understand. He said, I want you to take my jet and I want you to open up an air ambulance business. Never forget the charity and I need you to go change the world. Steve always said, if it's impossible, we do it. If it's difficult, we do it. If impossible, we just try harder. Steve was a yes man. He said, it's very easy, very easy to say no. Simple. Somebody asks you for a favor, you say no. He said, you need to figure out how to say yes. And in September 2013, Steve passed. He didn't die from the cancer. He was cancer-free when he passed. He died from the damage that was caused to his lungs by the chemotherapy. I was in a dark place once again. I questioned my mission in life. Up until now, I was always in the passenger seat, and Steve was in the captain's seat. It was time for me to take the lead. I didn't take the jet. It was too much for me at that point. But inspired by his light, I opened up an air ambulance company. And we would fly patients and medical teams and organs, hearts, lungs, livers, and kidneys. And we never forget about giving back. Greater than 25% of the missions that we do, we do at cost or below. Six weeks a year I spend flying with patients and children who are unwell all over the world. Since Steve's passing, we've done over 100 Dream Team missions. In 2016, Yochi got sick. The same disease that attacked his kidneys and his liver, when he was eight years old, attacked his lungs, interstitial lung disease. It was terrible. It seemed simple. All we had to do, his doctor said, is just get Yochi a lung. The quest for a lung began. 11 transplant centers. And it was very difficult. We flew all over the country. Pittsburgh, Houston, North Carolina, Baltimore, Cleveland, New York. Everybody said no. You see, Yochi was only about four feet tall because he had his transplant. When he was born, he was actually weighed 20 ounces as a preemie. The challenges they had were enormous. Two of them only. One of them thought he was very small. An adult lung wouldn't fit into his thoracic cavity. The second challenge, because he was on these anti-rejection medications, but his antibodies would be very high. And each trip that we went was very difficult. It would be a full two days. Parents would send in all his medical reports. 
We had to get somebody to accept him. Then we'd come in and they would do a blood work and lung function tests. And then they would sit and meet. I went along as both a friend and as a paramedic. Trip after trip, month after month, everybody said, no, we can't help you. You see, because the lung of an adult won't fit into your chest cavity, and we don't know what to do about your high antibodies. Yochi would get very upset at me afterwards. He would say, is that it? I should go home and die? That's it? Is my journey over? And I said, no, we're going to keep trying. And one day I had the opportunity to meet two amazing people, Dr. Harish Sithamraju and Dr. Scott Shinen in Montefiore Medical Center. I met them actually because we were discussing taking over their transplant program, which we did. And they were opening up and I said, by the way, what are you guys transplanting? And they said, we're going to transplant adult lungs. I immediately pulled out my phone and I showed it to them and I said, this young man, 11 different transplant centers, everybody, every single place said no. They said, well, why they say no? I said, because he's too small. He's four feet tall. I said, well, why don't we give him a small female lung? I said, that seems simple. What are you going to do about his high antibodies? They said, we can dialyze him before transport, before transplant. They said, that seems okay. I said, can I bring in a family? The next day, Yochi came in with his family, and a week after that, he was listed. Two and a half years he was on that list. He got sicker and sicker day by day. His oxygen went from two liters per minute to three to four to five. By the time we took him in for his final time, he was at 40 liters per minute. Yochi passed away. He didn't make it. In 2019, Yochi passed. He didn't get his lung. I was in a dark place once again. I felt like I failed him. I said, what, what have I done? I promised him a lung. And his mother told me, and I speak to her all the time, and she said, I have no doubt, I have no doubt that Yochi lived two years longer because he believed, he believed that one day he would get a, he would get a lung. And I realized that there are many challenges in transplant, and I wanted to see what I can do to make a difference. And one of the biggest challenges are the availability of aircraft. Many requests come in at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and on weekends, and there are many times that our aircraft are not available, and there's a possibility, a very strong one, that those who are sick are not going to be able to get their lung. I needed to shine my light to figure out what else I can do to help them. So I decided to build an Uber-type app so that operators and transplant centers wouldn't have to spend hours at 3 o'clock in the morning trying to figure out how to find an aircraft. We would have the ability to put hundreds of aircraft on our app and send that out, and we offered it to our competitors, to any transplant center. Anybody who needed it would have the ability to get an aircraft to be able to go save a life. We all have a light within us. We just have to find that, and we can share it with the world. And together, we can make the world a better place. Thank you for listening.